Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 464th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Shea for the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have the one and only Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of The Chicken Soup for the Soul and all of those other uh, iterations of that book, uh, which have changed the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Um, he is out to discuss his new uh, ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. Uh, we had a great talk. This guy is, uh, I met him once before in passing at a, at a conference years ago, and uh, but didn't really know him and he didn't know me. Uh, but I was glad we were able to connect. Um, he's launching this book. Uh, we talked about his One Minute Millionaire, uh, several other books, but uh, he's got his fingers in a lot of things. He is not slowing down at all. Uh, but we get into goals, big, hairy, audacious goals, should you have them. Um, the importance of trusting your gut versus having a detailed business plan. Um, when to take action, how to determine when you should take action. So it was really cool. We went a long time. Um, so, you know, buckle down, uh, schedule a little bit extra time for this, and um, you're going to be in for a treat. All right. You're going to get a lot of. A lot out of this, I promise. Um, as I was about to hit record, I get a text from a friend of mine I've known for many years. I actually went to the Air Force Academy with him. For, so we go back to 1988, and he texts me, and he says, what do you think about Salesforce.com? <laughs> I'm like, I hate it unless you're a big company. You know, I, I used it starting back in 2004, uh, trained Dell on it for 10 months, back in 07 when they were deploying it for their sales process transformation. So it's a great tool for big companies like that, uh, but not for smaller companies. And my buddy, I know he's with a small company. He just retired and, and joined a new company. So we're talking, like, well, what do you recommend? It's like, dude, there's so many, you know, and, and the reality is just about any tool you pick, if you use it fully, you're going to get a positive ROI out of it. So now the question becomes, which can give you the biggest ROI if you can use it fully? So then the question becomes, what tool is easy or has the best support and training so you can get up to speed uh, and use it fully? You know, so there's all these moving targets, if you will, or, or many variables, things to consider. And, um, you know, I, I work with HubSpot. Entreport, Infusionsoft, Active Campaign, Nimble, uh, and can support you on just about any other. But the reality, you know, sets in that it's it's literally garbage in, garbage out. There's not a perfect tool, so you got to look at cost of ownership, uh, cost of support, cost of adding on the additional tools that you need, the integrations. So you really got to weigh all that out, all right? I've had this free quiz for a long time, many, many years. I don't even know how long, but uh, it's best bestcrmforme.com. Take that quiz. It's free. It's multiple choice. It'll take you a couple minutes, uh, and it'll spit out some answers for you. It'll rank order them based on your answers, okay? And then if you still want to talk, if you still have questions, hit me up. You know, I can help you buy any of those platforms. I can help negotiate. Uh, I'm a certified partner of many of them, and so I get paid a commission by the company, so it doesn't come out of your pocket, okay? And so, and then I can help train you on it. If you already have one of those and you don't think it's right, I can help you switch. If you have one of those and you just want to get more out of it, I can help you do that, okay? So help me help you. Uh, take that quiz, bestcrmforme.com, and then send me an email, okay? Uh, at the end of that, it'll it'll rank order them based on your answers, and then it'll also rank order them based on price from lowest to highest. So you can pick the right tool for you, you know? And the main thing is, as long as you order from me, I get paid. So I, you know, I'm going to help you pick the right tool. If I steer you into the wrong tool, if I use my sales whisper mojo, and hypnotize you and use very seductive language and you buy something you shouldn't you're just going to yell at me online and and my reputation is ruined so you know there's nothing in it for me to steer you wrong just for a commission okay because my reputation is better more important than a passing fleeting commission so just let me help you help me help you you help me help you yeah something like that 
You with me? All right. Go take the quiz, bestcrmforme.com, and then come back and listen to Mark Victor Hansen. Mark Victor Hansen, the man, the myth, the legend, author of the new Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Glad to be here with you, Wes, and everybody listening, watching, or thinking with us somehow. So all the cool kids are moving to Scottsdale. I'm going to have to get up and move to hang out with all you cool people. Unequivocally, the smartest thing you could do. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to convince my wife of that. So we, uh, we shall see. I, I'm keeping mama happy. So that's the smartest thing I can oh, do. That is when you know the cliche, when mama's happy, everybody's happy. And I way out married myself. I got the best mama around for me. And, uh, <laughs> and I can tell you the good news is Scottsdale is beautiful. The bad news is we had 50 days over 110 degrees this year, most ever. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is our hottest summer, but oh, well, what you going to do, man? It's, uh, right. we, we can ask for better weather, but we may or may not get it. But we can ask uh, better questions and, and reach our dreams. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Is, is that for real? We do, yeah. What we did is, you know, Crystal and I have been to 80 countries, talked to all kinds of people, and we find people that are wonderful, likable, well-educated, professional, and the difference between those who have little success and those who have a vast, deep, profound success is one thing and one only, and that is they have the ability to ask. And most people have never been taught to ask, and what we're saying in the subtitle, ask is the title with an exclamation mark, the subtitle is The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. We're saying if you're alive, and especially if you've been locked down for seven months, like most of us have around the world, that's 8 billion of us. The only way you're going to get to your destiny is if you know how to ask. And we're teaching three ways to ask. Ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. So all of those are hard for a lot of people. <laughs> why a lot of people struggle. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yes and yes. How's that? I'll, there are two questions there, and I'll answer both yes. And so what we're trying to do is say, hey, look, we wrote seven roadblocks to asking, but we prefaced the book with the fable of Michaela, which my wife, brilliance, wrote in Wisdom. And what it does, it enrolls you into the metaphor so you're no longer afraid to ask because you understand the results at the end are so spectacular. I mean, look, I've sold a half billion books and nobody else ever did that, but I did it because I asked repetitively. As the father of seven children with a six-year-old still at home, a 23-year-old college graduate still asking for a little help now and then. I see kids, kids naturally ask. My six-year-old, goodness gracious. I mean, it's like the, like the story in the Bible, right? The woman just kept asking. He's like, fine, you get what you want, right? He's like, was she exceptionally holy? No, but she was persistent, you know? So you're talking about the, you touched my garment ask, that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. And you're well, one of seven. I'm one of four. My brother, my wife's one of nine. So we beat you by two. <laughs> no, I, I'm only one of two. But my wife and I, we have seven. Yeah, I know. And then, and yeah. then we have uh, five kids in our combined marriage and six grandkids. But oh, we, gotcha. we'll, we'll top it out at twelve. Nice. Well, we. Uh, but I mean, kids naturally ask. Like my six-year-old has no fear. She'll ask me. She'll go back and ask her mom. She'll she'll go ask one of her siblings to ask one of us. She will get what she wants eventually. Uh, but at some point, that seems to get beaten out of us uh, as right. young adults or adults. Have you, have you seen that? And do you have a way to help overcome that? By the way, you a multiplicity of layered questions. Yep, Every yep, kid's yep. born is is what we call and and our cliche is become a master asker. Every kid is born with infinite curiosity, infinite imagination, infinite ability, if they got loving parents like you, to know that, that they're not going to be defeated, crushed, beat up, spanked. Although, you know, there are a fair amount of parents that uh, are just so dysfunctional, they don't know how to do that right. But, you know, luckily, I had parents that I could keep asking. Now, my parents had absolutely no money. So I started with zero. And starting at nine, I had to ask for and get what I want. And at nine years old, I, I, I had a picture of a racing bicycle on the wall next to me and it said, ride a wheel on Sheffield Steel. I mean, it's in my head. And I didn't know there. I finally said, Dad, can I have it if I pay for it myself? In today's dollars, it's $4,000, like a Trek bicycle. So no nine-year-old can turn around that kind of money, right? That's what my dad thought. But I'm reading, I'm a Boy Scout, as you may know by reading my Vita, but it said, you can sell greeting cards on consignment. I said, I don't know what consignment is, but I looked it up and I said, you know what consignment is, you're a salesman, sure. right? 
How would you define consignment? Well, basically, you take someone's stuff, don't pay for it until you sell it, but you sell it at a markup and you keep the difference. Bingo. So I, I took it, got these greeting cards. My mother was a great saleswoman and a great raconteur, she, a storyteller. And uh, she said, here, you go to all our little neighbors. And I was living in little Denmark. My parents are both Danish, right? I'm a Danish uh, American, so a proud one. And uh, went around and knocked neighbors and just smiled and said, I'm earning my own bicycle. Would you like to invest in one box Christmas cards or two? Now, they thought I was a cute little nine-year-old, and I sold 376 box Christmas cards in one month, made enough money to buy it. My dad, to his infinite wisdom, which I despised at the time, took half that money and put it in my college fund. Can you imagine a parent doing such a thing? <laughs> That's awesome. You know, there's a little subtlety in there in your ask. Go ahead. I bet a lot of people didn't pick up on that. It reminds me of the old... Um, the old adage where the, the, the soda shop, you know, the, the drug stores, you, you know, when they sold the malt, yeah. and they want to increase their margins. Right. And they were, and they want to sell more eggs, right. They put a raw egg in the malt and the guy watched, and he's like, would you like an egg, you know, in your malt? How much is it? You know, whatever, nickel, whatever. No, no, no. But they changed around to say, would you like one egg or two? All right. You didn't give people an out. You didn't say, would you like to buy a box? Oh, no, no, no. You said, would you like to buy one or two? So now it's, it's the assumptive close. And as a nine-year-old, probably in your Boy Scout uniform, they couldn't say no. I was. And they, they didn't. And they did. And I became number one greedy card and salesman then. But now let's go forward 30 years. Jack and I are selling 15 million books a year. Guys fly in from a company, that company called American Greeting Cards, and said uh, they did not know my history. And they said, hey, look, you guys are really good writers. We want to do chicken soup for the soul greeting cards. And at this time I am becoming the biggest licensing guy then and now ever in books because back to asking nobody ever asked. And I read the book by Lucas and, and Spielberg and they'd made uh, 800 million on ET and a billion and a half licensing. So I went to Jack and I said, we're going to license. He said, what do you know about it? I said, nothing. But I said, I'm going to ask myself, I'm a systems theorist. One of my many degrees with Buckminster Fuller when I was in grad school everything's an outside and inside. I'm outside, but I'm going to get inside. And so we uh, sold and we sold 897,000 box of Christmas cards that I wrote at drug at grocery stores only in the same company 30 years later. Is that an interesting karma? That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what, what is this systems? Because now, now I'm curious, you got the engineering side of me. Oh, good. Uh, well, you know, Bertolampi's general systems theory. But what, do you know who Buckminster Fuller was, Einstein's sure. best student? Well, I, I was with Bucky seven years in grad school because I'm slow. I don't get stuff nearly fast. But once I got it, boy, you had better dang well watch out because I know a lot about engineering. And I, you know, I own a natural, natural Power Concepts, which is a company. If you've never looked at Natural Power Concepts, you want to look at our videos. We're in Oahu, Hawaii. We got the coolest alternative energy projects, products in the world. And we're, we got a gigantic order today. So I'm uh, beyond myself. We've got pop-up windmills that are going to solve all the problems that all the solar installations around the country and ours are portable, mobile, and we're only doing one state so far and the first order was for like 1,800. So it's like, you know, oh, like my goodness. they're like 400,000 each. So it's not like a little chump change. Mm -hmm. It's taken us 12 years to get here, which is if you've ever had to keep putting money in something for 12 years, you go, <laughs> You mean you couldn't just snap your fingers and tell them who you are and they just do what you say? Not only that, let me just tell you that most engineers, which you are one, you said, where'd you go to school? Uh, the Air Force Academy. Oh my God. One of the best. Uh, just so you know, I was on the board of the world's biggest airline and uh, the head of uh, military air command was general Bill Moore. Do you know Moore at all? He was just, know. well, he just, he, Cute story. Are you interested in a cute story? Sure. I'm on the board of this company and I'm living in Newport Beach and the chairman of the company is Del Smith. We did most of the military stuff. We flew all the UPS planes were ours. They were painted brown. Our, our pilots wore brown. He said, we're going to pick you up in the little Lear and take you over and be at the airport here at this time to go to our second air base is here in Arizona, Marana. And I get on a plane and I'm sitting with a guy in a suit in the back and he said, Bill Moore. And I said, Mark Victor Hansen. We had the greatest call. And I, he said, I've been in the service 28 years. I said, really? And 
dumbass me. I said, didn't you know you could retire at four years? He said, I think I knew that. <laughs> we, get, we get off and Bill's walking right in front of me and everyone's going, hello, general, hello, general, and a red carpet. I get, I feel like the biggest doofus ever. And I say, who is that guy? I said, that's General Bill Moore at a military air command and all of us would kiss his ring if he wants because we're doing so much work with the Air Force. No, like, right. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, next, the next day I was teaching, uh, you know, how to sell, how to prospect, present, be irresistible and close and have good work habits. And he sat in the front row taking notes. And I went up to him and I said, you know, Bill, what, you know, I'm really humbled. You spend more in a day than I will in a lifetime as uh, doing what you're doing. I said, what are you doing? He said, I never heard any of this stuff that you and I are talking about, like assumptive clothes. Right. Stuff that, you know, you, you're not born knowing any of that, or at least right. unless you know something that I don't know. Right. You know, right. it's learnable. Everybody needs to learn to be a, a yeah. sales whisperer. I tell everybody, you know, the, you know, great salespeople really are made. Um, you may have an affinity towards it. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I tell people all the time, selling is, it's just as prescriptive as engineering. Exactly. And, you know, and, and I, I give extreme examples when I'm with people, you know, I, and just to, to make a point quickly, right? If I had just looked at you, oh, Mark, where'd you get those glasses? Those are the ugliest, worst glasses I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh my gosh. They, you know, you have no style. You want me to change glasses? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have your feelings hurt, right? Nope. You know, but a converse, hey, I love your shirt. It's a great shirt. Where'd you get that shirt? You have great taste. What's the material made of? You'd be like, this is a really nice, this guy's really smart because uh, I'm agreeing with you already, right? So, I mean, just I use your know, simple examples, but it, I know how you're going to react from either of those engagements. And, and we can take it a, a hundred more steps, but if people will simply take the time to learn that, sales really is a lot more, uh, a lot more scientific than people think. Exactly. So I, I admire you. Keep doing it. And, and I also congratulations and thank you for serving. Thank we you. Do a lot of work with the military, as you know. And, and right. Uh, the second thing we do that, you know, because the reason I've sold more books than anybody alive, I think, is that uh, we contribute on every book. We tied to somebody and we um, we regularly talk to wounded warriors down at Bliss in a few places. And these are some of the nicest, most wonderful people that have had their bodies blown apart and, and uh, are sometimes up to half or some guys have no legs and arms and you still love them. And yep. even my wife and I hug all of them well and that was illegal to do, as you know. It's not as... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. I, every January, I swim five kilometers across Tampa Bay for the, the Navy SEAL Foundation and uh, that crowd doesn't care. I mean, they're, they're rebels, right? They're tough. Their families are tough. Uh, and so it's, we're doing uh, a lot of podcasts with the, uh, is his name Tonto or Conto, whatever it is. And oh yeah. The, the seals. Yeah. They've yeah. Done this. By the way, let's just do that for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know how great our seals are and why we need to back not only the military, but the police, the first responders, the fire people, I'm going to tell you, you and I have never met before, I don't think, have we? Uh, in passing at conferences, but we didn't ever sit down. Yeah. So the point is, that, ladies and gentlemen, we got to support those people because they support us. Law and order is the necessary thing in America today more than ever. I mean, we've got cities falling apart and it just breaks my heart because all these people want to work hard are very smart in my experience, by and large. Or every, there's, every profession has some bad apples. But right. that's all that the media talks about. We got great people at every level. Yep. Amen. Uh, all right. We got on tangents. I will do that. Okay. You're older and wiser. You're supposed to keep me focused. Uh, all right. But look, here we go. By the way, the people about- are interested, though. <laughs> no, I know. I'm taking notes over here. And then, by the uh, way, they can go read my book. And, you know, my books are very solid. They're very focused because my publishers go, ah, you can do better than that. <laughs> But I do have a question, though. But after we get back to what what were you saying about your systems? You're a systems engineer. A system. A system I've redefined that as an acronym, one word that means other words. Save yourself time, energy, and money. Gotcha. And the system has an inside and an outside, right? The universe is the biggest system. Einstein said it's finite but boundless, but we can look at all of it, right? 
And the same thing here. So you take a little system like licensing. I know when it started. I know who does what. I learned everything because I'm an omnivorous reader. And back to you saying you're an engineer, what Bucky used to teach is universe means when you go to university, you're supposed to study universe. So I studied every aspect of, there's not much you can ask me or people in licensing that I don't know. Cause I said, look, I'm going to know this. And, and we did $157 million worth of dog food and we got 15% and I don't have to eat it. I don't have to deliver it. I don't have to carry it. Nothing. Although back when I lived in, in Newport, I was on one acre, had 88 animals because my daughter was becoming a veterinarian and uh, she couldn't find an animal she didn't want to take home. And I wasn't, and our vet said, what do you got a sign on your roof that says we pay all vet bills? I said, yes, sir. I think we have that. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I said to the people at uh, Diamond Pet Food when they came to talk to me, because I'm the one that did all the licensing contracts. I said, look, I just did a talk for Purina with uh, Jay Leno, curiously enough, and they had a great product as well positioned as beautifully packaged. And it went up in sales one month and crashed the next month. And the chairman said, what happened? Said, the dogs don't like it. So I said, look, you guys at Diamond, I'm asking you, but I'm asking you to make it organic. I'm asking you to make sure it looks good, packages good. We'll put a little book in there. But the dogs, we've got to like it. I got four dogs and we're going to test it on my dogs. If they don't like it, I'm not doing the deal with you. And, and by the way, that's why we got one of the best selling dog foods ever in history. It's all by asking. Life is about asking. Does that make sense? For sure. So let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Yeah. You've got, you've got uh, a whole, speaking of licensing, right? You've got a lot of chicken soup for the soul um, books. And I, so like I, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I, I train at noon, just got done, came back. Um, and and I, I had this question. I didn't have time to ask a guy because I had to get home. Um, but I can ask you cause it's related. So, you know, like, like any, any sport, right. I know golf, you know, every, every golfer's got their favorite club, you know, seven iron, nine iron, you know, when, when it's clutch time, they go to that. Uh, jujitsu, it's like the same. You, you have a certain move that you can do very well. Uh, but my question for my buddy, when I'll see him tomorrow, it's like, I, I have that certain move that, and I can pull it off, but sometimes I get bored and I'm like, I need to expand my game. I need to learn other moves, especially in practice, because that's what practice is for, right? If it's a contest, a tournament, I have never seen this guy, all the money's on the line. Okay, I'll, I'll go to my go-to move. So, but again, it gets boring. Has, how have you kept that title, that series from being boring for yourself? Because I know a lot of entrepreneurs, sh they shoot themselves in the foot because they get bored with whatever and they want to go tinker with this, tinker with that. And they, they forget where their how their bread is buttered, right? So how have you stayed so focused and energized by these various titles that are you know spinoffs on your your core you know that first book? Well, first of all, I think everybody ought to have a lot to do. I mean, you know, you're here to live life and you're more abundantly. John ten ten and Upanishad said the same thing: out of abundance, here she took abundance, and still abundance remain. So I've always had a lot of books to work on at the same time. Like one of the other books I did, because I think everyone should write a book that's out right now. It just came out yesterday as you have a book in you, which is like sort of cool because I think everyone ought to write a book. The point is, is that I can't get bored about any of this stuff because all of this stuff works at all the stuff. And what I finally got our publisher to do on this book, which, you know, it took us two years to write. So it wasn't easy, but it lists all the 309 books that I've written. Nobody's ever done that before. And I thought, well, maybe somebody has, but most people have four or five books because every publisher says, well, you know, I published One Minute Millionaire behind me with Random House. And they said, we wouldn't publish that. That was published by you and Harper or some, or, some, or HCI. And you go, what? The point is every book should help sell every other book, right? And I happen to love to write. I happen to love to read. I happen to think I love doing these podcasts with people that I've never met before or, or you and I passed, I met in passing, you said. But the bottom line is, everybody's got more in them. And what happens is you have to have high, lofty, and inspired goals. You got to have goals that are so big. Like, I want, I've sold a half billion books, but I want to sell a whole billion. Nobody's ever done it. But because you're talking about a sport, let me modify it to running. You know who the first guy to run a four-minute mile was? Do you remember his name? Yeah, Bruce uh, Bannister. Yeah, Roger Bannister. Roger He's Bannister. A doctor. And they said, well, if you do that, your heart will jump out of your chest. Right. In the next week, 119 people ran a four-minute mile. Not because... 
physically, we were always able to do it. I mean, I, I've done the Boulder, my brothers and I do the Boulder Boulder every year when it was open. And, and we have a big family of 50, you know, extended people all do it. But we watch the Kenyans run four minute miles just to finish the dang thing. And we look like we're going backwards, right? <laughs> but the, the point is, is it goals are set to be broken. Goals are set. Everyone needs more targets than they've got. So you need targets on your new moves in golf. That And then number two is if you're really a golf addict, don't you want to golf the best 100 courses in the world? Sure. Yeah. Well, then you want to get really good because it's going to be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> better be good at something because uh, you're going to lose some golf balls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and beyond that, if you're, because it's a sales whisper and I assume mostly your sales and entrepreneurs are listening to us, right? Right. You, like I was listening to uh, Grant Cardone this morning and he says, look, a million used to do you okay, but now you need a 10 million just to get in the game. So if you haven't got a target, of 10 million, ladies and gentlemen, write down a target. You got to have a net worth of a minimum of 10 million. And the minute you said it, it gets exciting. See, a million isn't exciting enough because it, it, it's, you know, any way you divide it, or if you divide it by, you know, 20 years, 50 years, or however long you're going to live, it's not enough to generate enough money to live and have a substantial, fully functioning life where not only do you take care of yourself and seven kids in your case, which is every kid costs a quarter million bucks, as you know, to get from zero to 18. Amen. And then you, through college, it's a lot more expensive. And you still got a six-year-old at home. <laughs> So what do you say to the bag carrying, quota carrying salesperson, you know, making a hundred grand a year, you know, doing okay. Um, or the entrepreneur, the, the chiropractor owns their own clinic, you know, maybe he's taking home 200 grand all said and done or heaven forbid the, the restaurant owner, right. Who's doing carry out only or 25% in, in the restaurant right now. How, what do they do when they to set a ten million dollar ten million dollar goal, right? As a, you know, if you're making a hundred grand a year, you're thirty years old in sales for a decent company, you got a pretty good life. How? But but let's say they are, um, they're motivated. They want more. You know, they listen to this. They go, you know what? Mark's right. I want a ten million dollar net worth. What's the first thing they do? Okay, so let me go backwards. First of all, the food chain. Because I'm now being asked to help one of the billion dollar food companies do B to C because I've been doing B to B business and it won't work anymore. And this weekend we were with a guy with, I don't mind saying Ger Garamaldi's pizza, which is one of the big three chains in America. And this guy is booming because instead of him delivering pizza, like every other pizza company, he sent out 780,000 emails a week and says, Hey, look, Wes, instead of us coming to you, you come to us and we're going to save you 20%. And his business is over the top. It's so much over the top. The biggest potato chip company came to him and said, we want to put your name in all our bags because you're doing marketing at levels we don't know. So that's food. You got, the, what I'm saying is asking, which is why everyone's got to read the ask book because it'll wake you up. It'll be transformative. It'll give you illumination and solution. And he read it and it's obviously done that for him. His name is Joe Chiali and his wife, Ivy. But, okay, so that's that. Back to the first guy. There's three models you gave me. The first guy, the $100,000 a year guy. $100,000 a year seems like it's enough. It just is not enough. Because by the time you pay 40% taxes, you're not on it. 60 grand. And 60 grand isn't enough to, to buy a car, have a house. Now, if you're always leasing a car and you want to have monster debt for the rest of your life, and, and that doesn't make it work. So what I'm asking you to do is say, hey, wait a second what would it take me in this sales job to make a million a year? Or can I make a million in this company? And if I can't, am I open enough to either figure out my own entrepreneurial deal or create multiple sources of income or do a part-time job and make more of my part-time job than, I, than my full-time job and make more in a month than I ever have in a year? Because we're saying if you do 100000 a month, that's a million to a year. That'd be good. And what was the middle example you gave me? We had a food like, example. Like a no. chiropractor, you okay. know, or a restaurant owner. Okay, so chiropractors. So first of all, as you may know, I've trained chiropractors as one of my four big marketplaces. I don't know if you hit that on purpose or not, but I got 10 honorary doctors, three in chiropractic from Life, from Cleveland, from Parker Universities. And um, matter of fact, I'm doing a big graduation for uh, Life University here in uh, Atlanta shortly again, when they open up next January. Um, they think they'll be open. Um, what, what I did is when, when we wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, the publisher wouldn't do it for a year and a half. 
and Jack and I were already owed 180 grand each and didn't have any money. So we both started with zero. And so I came up with this idea and, and what I, if you go to my website, markpickjansen.com, you know, I go through it, but I say, look, here's what you got to do if you write a book. But when you write a book, you got to do interviews. And if you can do interviews, you got to package them as a book or a set of tapes or a podcast or a webinar and then sell it. And I interviewed the 21 people in chiropractic that were all making over a million a year, cash practices, no insurance. I'll just give an example of one. We interviewed the guy in Denver, um, Dr. Dennis Nikita, who's a dear friend in Nikita said, all you got to do to build the biggest practice in town is carry a rubber band. Sounds like a dumb idea, doesn't it? What the hell's a rubber band got to do with getting rid of subluxation? But here's a subluxation. He said, and you put a rubber band around a guy's finger tightly and you say, okay, Wes, I'm going to pretend, pretend I'm going to be your doctor. What color does that turn? Purple. Then if I leave it on there too long, what color? Black. <laughs> then it falls off. <laughs> yeah. Now I've asked you three questions. Now, Wes, as your wannabe doctor, if you go to a medical doctor, can he or she get rid of a subluxation? No. If you go to a PT, a physical therapist, can they do it? Don't think so. If you go to a nurse, can they do it? No. Nope. Go to a massage therapist, can they do it? No. Nope. You go to a Pilates. Okay, so he goes through 12 different things, and then he says, well, who is going to get rid of it? I am, and I'd love you to be my patient. Now, here's the deal, because – at the time, the Clintons had taken away all the insurance from chiropractic. These guys were all sinking. And so I said, look, I'm going to help all of you, but you got to help me. I am the spokesperson for the American Red Cross. Liddy Dole came to me. They're out of blood. And we went to doctors. They wouldn't give it to us. So I said, look, there are 20, 77,000 of you with 25 million patients a month. I need you to reactivate all your old patients. Here's the letter. Send it out and say, we're going to, you're going to call 800 Give Life. Schedule a blood mobile out in front of your practice. And I want you to give a free adjustment to everybody who gives a pint of blood. We got enough blood for a year and a half. So what does that mean? In mathematics, because you're an engineer, you know this, a negative times a negative equals? Positive. Yeah. Isn't this fun? So <laughs> chiropractic was in a negative situation. And by the way, I say this to you all listening because a lot of you are hanging on by your fingernails. And I've been broke twice in my life and it once $2 million down. So I'm real clear about what I'm saying. So the negative in the chiropractic, the negative in we're out of blood and people die. If you go to the hospital and you need blood, ladies and gentlemen, there's no pseudo blood. So if you haven't given blood, you need to give it. If you've had COVID and got rid of it, you've got platelets, you've got to give it. From my point of view, I think you've got a duty, a responsibility, an obligation. And, and you say, well, I'm too whatever. They, we got rid of all the age because, you know, a lot of old people got this thing because they had pre-existing conditions. Anyhow, the point is, if you start asking those kind of questions, I built a great, I sold $3 million worth of the tapes in a month afterwards. I, I did the interviews for one week with the 21 top doctors. Then I entered, then I uh, put it together and then I said it, Hey, you guys are going to go bankrupt unless you get these tapes and buy them. And they all bought them. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I love it. Um, but you know, so tomorrow I'm starting a three part uh, program for people to launch their ideas, right? I'm trying to help people just get off the dime and, and, and grow, right? Build that side business, monetize your, your idea. And one of the ladies on my weekly group call, she's going to be in that call. Uh, and she had mentioned that she, she has seen others um, do a webinar, do a live event. And with the whole goal really of being to monetize that thing, obviously the big upsell at the end, run to the back of the room. And she, she feels dirty right? Doing that. And, and I have struggled with that to a degree, right? I don't, I don't want people to feel like I'm just, the whole thing is one big pitch. Uh, but I did give her the analogy. I mean, I, I listened to Zig Ziglar, still listen to him, you know, to this day. And he's he, great. Was and great. He's dead. He right. would talk about, you know, I said, look, I, I can motivate you for an hour or a day or two, but if, if that's it and you just leave, you're going to forget everything I told you. In a month, you're going to forget 90% of what I ever told you. He's like, I need you to buy these cassette tapes, you know, back in the day for your own good, right? You got to listen over and over and over for really to sink in. So it's like, and nobody ever accused Zig of being manipulative, but how did we get over that? Right. That, that, that might be the ask yourself, right? Like ask yourself to care enough to sell something, right? Right. I mean, I've asked everybody more than once on this show already to buy our book, ask, just go to Amazon, get it, and then join, ask the book club, 
mastermind.com free with Crystal Mark. We're going to help make you a master asker because everybody's going to have to learn how to ask and re-pivot, reinvent, reorient themselves, re-entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is just a problem solver for a profit. And if you solve somebody's problem, like I, I just told you, I solved the chiropractic problem. I solved the blood problem. I didn't get paid by the Red Cross, by the way. I don't want to misrepresent anything. You know, and I got a big trophy and, you know, they said, nobody's ever done this before. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, the point is all of us are here to have monster success. But the only way to do it, as far as I'm concerned, is if you master the fine art of asking and don't feel guilty about asking. That's why in our little book here, what we did is we did seven roadblocks to asking. We said, what you're really talking about is your sense of self-worth. If I ask you, you might think I'm dumb. You might think I'm stupid. You may think I'm ignorant. You may think I don't know enough. You may think whatever you may think, right? But in a life insurance business, when I train there, you know, if you already have a, a nice car, whatever it is, whether it's Cadillac or Lincoln or Mercedes or Beamer or, or Tesla, I'd say, well, wait a second. Don't you want to have a million dollar insurance policy for your wife? I mean, that's the most important thing, right? Because you're the goose. That, anyhow, so you got to overcome your sense of self-worth and we teach how to do that. Then you got to overcome all fear because all of us have fear. And Zig used to say, false evidence bearing is real. He and I did a lot of programs together. Then you got to come over disconnectedness because all of us get plugged in. Well, if I ask them and they say no to me, I'm going to be rejected. Well, Jack and Mark got rejected <clears throat> 144 times with Chicken Soup of the Soul. Nobody wanted it. All the big guys said, nobody will buy short stories. That nicey, nice junk. Anyhow, point is, uh, our agent even fired us. So, You've got to be rejection proof. If you really know you've got a high quality value, then that quantity of service plus the quality of service equals unlimited compensation. And every one of us is entitled. Eight billion of us alive are entitled to unlimited compensation. And today we can get going and make that all happen for the first time in history. So we've said unworthiness. We've said disconnected. We've said excusology. Maybe I didn't say that. We've said pattern paralysis. My older brother, God bless him, had a photographic memory, but he wanted never to, to look anything so he was shy. I take him to the airport after he came and visited us, and I said, now you know how to get through the airport. He was 81 at the time. and Because I've been in airports a quarter million miles a year for 44 years flying around talking to 80 countries. I thought everyone did. Later on, as in the, late in the afternoon, his daughter calls me and said, do you hear what happened with dad, didn't you? And I said, no said he got lost in the airport and missed his plane, had to wait 13 hours just in Phoenix. I said, Jody, dad and I are best friends. He should have just called me. I would have come picked him up, taken him to breakfast or something, anything. But, but he's afraid to ask. And this, this thing about robot. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're afraid to ask, two things. Number one, I'm giving you 100% permission to ask. If everyone says, what makes you have permission to ask, Wes? Well, Mark Victor Hansen said I had full permission to ask. Man, he said he could be, you, you could use his name. World's best-selling author gave me permission to ask you, Mr. Big. Because if you go to Mr. or Ms. Big, they got more money. They got, uh, Grant would say, they got your money. And, and if you really get there to serve them, and Christ said, the greatest amongst you is servant of all. So you and I are supposed to serve greatly by selling greatly. I love selling. Yeah. And I, there's not a day in my life I haven't sold and won't sell, and I'm going to live to be 127 with options for renewal. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so 144 times. You know, some people would say, maybe you should have quit at 100, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Or one. <laughs> I mean, how, how do we know when, when we have a bad idea, right, versus uh, we just haven't asked the right person? I mean, when, you know, when does that entrepreneur know? Number two, the right person. What's that? More often than not, it's going to be the right person because you're going to have to go through a lot of, um, you know, it, it's the law. It, in the Bible, it talks about the faith and ratios is, uh, you know, where did the seed fall? And most seed doesn't fall on the right person. So, you know, you might have to call on 10 to get one. When I did do my first seminars, when I had no brochure, no ability, nothing in the insurance business, but I knocked on 10 doors. One, the 10th guy said, yes, at 630 at night. And he was a nice old Italian guy that was maybe weighed 450 pounds. I'm sure he's no longer around, and I, but he was really wonderful. And we just had the greatest conversation. And he thought, if you can call on me at 6:30 at night, I want you to sell my people on how to do that. And that, and he said, here, kid, I'm with Prue. That's the number one company. No, sorry, he was with Metropolitan. I'm number one guy in Metropolitan. And he said, 
my name's Tony. You just tell all these guys in the directory to call me. And uh, I'll tell them they all got to hire you. And I was doing four seminars on prospecting, presenting good work habits, closing. And, and it just, I, it rocked. In the first year, I did a thousand talks. And for the first three years, Tony Robbins and I, as far as I know, are the only two guys who ever did that. So the point is, if you want massive success, you got to take massive action. And the guy making a hundred grand a year is probably not taking as massive action as he could. Because the question, like my wife, I said, are we doing everything we can to make this happen? Right. So, all right, going back to that hundred thousand dollar guy. Yeah. Probably e even before COVID, right? He's making a hundred grand, but he's probably working a pretty good bit. Yeah. The company's probably flying him around a bunch of crappy meetings. Got to fill a lot of Excel spreadsheets and CRMs right. and take clients golfing, take them to dinner, take them to breakfast. Um, you know how. I see people, they literally are, they're sacrificing their lives for that paycheck. You know, oh. how, how can they have a life, still give the company, you know, a good, a good effort, you know, so they're, they're earning their pay, but not, but not waste their life away earning that paycheck only to be laid off as soon as, you know, the first tough time comes around. Great question. So three parts to it. Number one, you got to know when you are most productive. Like I'm productive mostly in the morning. I'm on a, unequivocally the, you know, I write the best in the morning, sell the best in the morning. You, you know, I have a great attitude in the morning and I exercise first and then I'm ready to go. Number two is you got to pick the days in your schedule that you're going to clean up all the messes, fill out all the spreadsheets, do all the, what we call garbage work or push it onto your secretary. If you've got such a, a person or assistant or whatever it's called. And then three, what are your free days? And a free day has got to happen at least one day a week where you're totally clean and not working. And for most people, that would be a Sunday. And then on Monday, you'll come back more energized than ever and do better. But let's go back to just the green. If we're color coding, it would be green days are your prime money making days. You can't let anything interrupt that day when you're supposed to be selling. If it's on a Monday, let's say in a Tuesday, you can't go golfing. You can't be spending too much time in a restaurant with somebody that's not buying you got to really do your do and be with people that are, are, are actionable uh, buyers. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, if you can figure out how to, with, with Zoom calls, get all those actionable buyers to come together because you bring some treat to them that nobody else can, some piece of insight, and sell all of them at once on a Zoom call because maybe you can't go place to place anymore for two reasons. Number one is we're not allowed to fly everyone. Everyone doesn't want to see us anymore. And number two is that, the amount of flights available are like American laid off 8,000 pilots yesterday. I read. So and it, it's going to be tougher and tougher for me to get to you or you to get to me. Yep. Amen. So was there a third? Oh, the three things. So green days are the days you're working yellow yep. days. You're cleaning up your mess and purple God's highest color at the top of the electromagnetic spectrum are your days totally off. It could be your two week vacation, four week vacation, whatever it is. But I would ask you to break up your vacations. If you're going to do four weeks a year, do a week, you know, in each quarter. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Purple is my, that is what I use on my calendar, actually, for that. So yeah, my, my book, One Minute Millionaire, which is right there, is purple and yellow. And it's got a the universal symbol of illumination is, uh, do you have one? Are you one of my lucky uh, winners that has one? <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't luck. Come on, man. <laughs> did you read it cover to cover? I did. Well, that, that if you flip the pages, it shows I, I had a butterfly in the right-hand side yep. fly off the top where my goal is to, you know, create a million millionaires. And I see, here's the answer to your question. I'm glad you asked it. The first line of the book I wrote was, there's a million ways to make a million. And there's one right, easy, acceptable way to you. Now, I don't want everyone to be a speaker because everyone doesn't have the ability as a raconteur that I got, but I've developed it over, you know, 44 years of doing this business. Everyone can't write. I mean, I've been writing since I was 16 and I love it. And I get a lot of rejections and editors will say, Whew, are you sure? <laughs> and they still do that to me. So I, in back to another question you'd asked earlier and I didn't answer it is, is whether a, uh, how to know it's sale. Feedback is a breakfast of champions. And if you're getting negative feedback, it means it doesn't work. But the stories that Jack and I are doing in Chicken Soup were rating so high. Everybody in the audience said, do you have that in a book? I got to have that in a book. 
And, you know, so we knew that it would work. And uh, the publishers didn't believe us. And, and yeah. I guess I was crazy. I said, well, so, because I believe in gigantic goals, like a million and a half, a year and a half, we did a million three. Then I said, we'll go to five million. And no, they went, this guy's out to lunch. And we did that. And then 10 million a year and then 15 million a year. And, you know, we got more Guinness Book of Records than anyone because everyone said, you can't do that. Well, I also, people say, well, you didn't really write 309 books. Well, I can show them to you. They're all right here. You know, little books like tithing. Unless you go to church, you're not going to see that. You yeah. know, most churches sell my book in pretty much volume. Yeah. Do do people today need a a formal publisher or like what's what role do you see self publishing have? Because my two books, you know, are self published. I, I don't have the patience that you have. I don't know to go through a publisher, but uh, should I? Should I just bite the bullet and do the work and? get an official publisher for my next book? Well, I've got five publishers, so I got to be careful here. But the bottom line <laughs> is today, given, given that every book is being sold by Amazon, and I don't wish that, but when our publisher called us and said, look, you bring it out, ask, comes out April 28th. We're in the height of COVID. As a matter of fact, at the time he called us, he had COVID. He cured himself, thank God, with hydrochloroquine and z and zinc, all of which I believe in and had to use when I got it. But the point is, is that, uh, and I cured in one day, because you do it at the beginning, you're safe. And, and you got a lot of idiots out there that are lying about the truth. So um, I just had that experience. So I was, I'm real keen on this one. Anyhow, eight, eight out of nine of us got it, but we didn't have, uh, we didn't get the prescription. They all had it easy. I had crap. I had sinuses, fever for five days, but still beat it. Well, I thought I was dead the day I had it. And I said, you had to take it the first day. That's the law. I, by the way, I, I wrote that other book I think I sent you called How to Be Up and Down Times with Mitzi Perdue. Did, you, did I send you that? No. I'll send you one when we're done. Okay. Anyhow, my gift. Um, so back to your question, my answer is t two parts. Number one is I think, yeah, you just publish it with Amazon and, and make sure you're getting the highest royalty you can from. And number two is that once you sold 40,000 copies, then go to a publisher. Now you're going to get a really good payday. And the best example I write about there, my friend, Dr. Ken Blanchard, Kenny taught Jack at Harvard. He's one of Jack's, but Ken and I, are, I've been on his board of directors, a lead like Jesus and all that. Anyhow, Ken and uh, um, Spencer Johnson, a medical doctor, wrote One Minute Manager and then they wrote Who Moved My Cheese. But they sold 40,000 copies. They copied them on a little Xerox machine like I got here in my office. And they sold them and then they went and they got $4 million because they'd sold 40,000 copies, right? right? Now, you know, you want to come in with strength and say, hey, look, not only is it selling, but other people want. And the other guy that did that is the guy who wrote the Christmas box. He self-published. Um, I can see his face. I can't pull his name right now. But, you know, the good news is I've been doing books so long. I know most of the major authors in the world and I like all of them because it's a tough it's a tough road to hoe and it's tough to write and it's tough, tougher to sell. But I'm saying when you got a great book, you're only 10% done. 90% is the sales, the marketing, the advertising, and, and, you know, deciding to do the hard work of getting it going. And, and it's like an airplane, which, cause you know more about planes. Than I do 90% of the fuel is burnt up on the runway. Right? <laughs> and it goes into a high level flight and you trim to have it and float, right? Metaphorically float. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> If you float too much, you crash. <laughs> yeah. Although I did fly gliders, so you are kind of floating on those. <laughs> By the way, that's, I got to tell you that I got over 15,000 goals in writing, one of which is to learn to fly a glider. It's still my goal. Oh, I mean, man. I am a pilot, but I want to be a glider. I want to fly a glider. I mean, I watched uh, uh, Steve McQueen did the movie the first time. I can't think of the name, but right now. Da -da 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 Anyhow, you know the movie. <laughs> Yeah, when they when you when you pull that handle, and you see that front hook open, and that tow rope go away, and it's just quiet. <laughs> You're like, it's like Arizona right now. Arizona is empty because everyone left to Minnesota or wherever they go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I live on top of the hill at McDowell Mountain, and we've gone to California a couple times and Flagstaff to cool off. But basically, it's it's hot here, so almost nobody's home. Yeah, and if you catch a thermal, like huh? in Colorado, you know, Colorado Springs, we're already up, you know, over a mile. And then you get these thermals coming off the mountains. And, I mean, on my solo, I mean, they, they teach you how to slip it, right? You just turn it and literally slice through the wind because you get these thermals and you just, you'll go up, you know, almost to the moon. 
and uh, that's a bad thing in a in a glider with no oxygen. So you got to learn how to how to bring it back down. But yeah, you hit those thermals, you'll just you'll go up and up and up. And you'll just stay up. <laughs> how, high, how high is the highest you ever went up? Um, so I took, I think 11 flights of training. Um, and, uh, I think, I think I soloed on my 11th, uh, but you don't go that high. Uh, you know, we go a few thousand feet, maybe above ground level. Were you ever scared? No, I, um, you know, you're with an instructor. How many hours of pilot have you got underneath you? Oh, not much. I grew up flying actually with my family, my dad and my grandfather. So I have I had more time flying with them than it, I wasn't a pilot in the Air Force. So uh, not all that much, although I've, I've flown in just about everything, you know, F-16 and C-130s and C-5s and all kind of things. So, but yeah, I didn't fly them. But that, yeah, go, go fly a glider. <laughs> I want to. It's in, it's in my goals. I, usually I pull off everything I say I'm going to do. I just haven't taken time to do it. So speaking of goals, how, how far out do you write goals? Because you already said you're going to lift 127 with an option to renew. So do, do you have yeah. a 254-year goal? <laughs> the truth is I wrote 100-year goals. Like I want to – I think you need to write some big, hairy, audacious goals. And, and I'll just give you mine only because you've asked. But I want to house on house humanity. I want to feed and fed humanity expeditiously and omniconsiderately because I'm an alternative energy guy. I want to have portable, transportable energy to take care of the 4 billion people that don't have energy right now. And, and today, as I told you, we just got the first contract. I, I invested $2 million in this company, you know, 12 years ago. And today is the first time we got a contract. It's been, it has been, I, I, I was, I thought we we're going to hang ourselves on this one. I just, I, it has been a slug forward because you know, everybody still thinks they ought to use diesel, which is ugly, it's dirty, it's dangerous. And to go to the 20,000 islands around the world, it's polluting. And and we're having, as you know, abdurant weather everywhere. I mean, whether we're talking about the two hurricanes that went through the Caribbean and then into Louisiana, or we're talking about 14,000 homes is what the number I read burned in California. And they won't have energy now for the next year. I mean, I'm telling you that I got portable wind. I, it's called wind charger and we drive it in, pop it up. It goes, I designed it. So it goes 360 degrees. I mean, Petrie is a major designer. I'm a minor. I'm partially on that patent. I, I am not an engineer like you. I do not claim engineering. I, I claim I hang out with engineers. So I understand it. I got the vocabulary, but I don't have the training that you do. Well, still seems like you're doing it right. <laughs> I'm having a ball. <laughs> and it, 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 I've had plenty of resistance. And I say the times we're in for all the people that are listening, a lot of you, like I said a minute ago, a lot of you are hanging on by your fingernails. And I've been bankrupt and went down $2 million once and slept on another guy's door in 1974 when the oil embargo crashed and burned. And I was building the Wall Street Racquet Club, Botanical Gardens, Aviaries. And it was my best, worst experience. So some of you are going through that right now. And you got to understand the reason I'm, I'm begging you on your behalf to read Ask is it'll take you from adversity to see the advantage because there's a golden um, lining in everything and, and take adversity and see the opportunity in it because there's more. Remember, the yin and the yang, 6,000 years old symbol says crisis equals opportunity. If we got the biggest crisis, we got the biggest opportunity. And, and once you take off the blinders, which asking does, right, ask yourself, who am I and what is it that I can do? What is my unique talent? Where's my acres of diamonds? Where's my genius? And then, you know, ask yourself, ask others and ask God. And we're saying, when you ask God, you go deep. You say, God, what's your destiny for me? God, what's your destiny for me? God, what's your destiny for me? 400 times before you go to sleep, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night, but you got to tell your sweetheart before you go to sleep, sweetie, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to have this thing come through. And God's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do with my life now and start making money tomorrow. And I'm going to have to write it down. Now you say, does that work? Well, that's how Jack and I came up with the title. He in his house in Santa Barbara, me in Newport Beach, 2.38, he calls me in the morning, wakes up the whole house. Back then we didn't have cell phones. This is 1989. And um, said chicken soup. I said for the soul. And both of us got goosebumps. We knew that it would work. And uh, publishers didn't believe it, but we did. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. It does. It's called a thought command. And every one of us, 
needs today because of this sequestration, and I'll give a chicken soup story, a chicken soupy story out of ask if you're open to it. We all need to reorient our mind and give ourselves mind command. Back to that $100,000 guy, when I'm doing seminars starting in 1974 after going bankrupt, <clears throat> a guy told me what to do and how to do it, Chip Collins. I asked him and he told me, I'm calling on Pia. I suddenly say, well, I want to make 100 grand a year. That's 250 work days times $400 a day is 100 grand, right? And I knew what I had to do to get there and got there. And then I'm talking to the top salesman in insurance, Ben Feldman. And Feldman, who was making $4 million a year, said, no, no. He said, if your kid's life depended on it, could you make 4000 in a day? I said, yeah, I'd do anything for my kid. So he said, no, I'll just do it 250 times. I started making a million a year because you change your mindset. You change your goal. But the goal has got to be in writing. And I'm saying you got to, like it says in the book, you got to have a three by five card and write, I am so happy. I am earning this by doing this. And you sign it and get your spouse to sign it or your boss to sign it. Look at it four times a day, brand it into your brain, etch it in the fabric of your being, morning, lunchtime, dinner, and more importantly, before you go to sleep because the subconscious never sleeps. And, and like I'd wake up at 2.58 in the morning and I'd have a name like Bill Widener, State Mutual. And I said, okay, I got to write it down. I don't know who the heck that is. The next day I'm out cold calling people to sell my seminars. I go to this building, insurance companies are all in the same building, sort of like McDonald's is next to Taco Bell and all that. They hang together and then they steal each other's people. It's sort of a <laughs> nutso thing. Car dealers do the same thing. Anyhow, um, I don't believe in stealing people's people. I don't believe in proselytization, it's called. But I'm, I'm in there and it says, Bill Widener, State Mutual. I go in the office, no secretaries at the desk, go to his office. He wrote me a check for $400 in like five minutes, he said, you're so happy. I didn't care if you never came back. You just made me happier because you're happy to get it. But he ended up getting me the whole company to train the company for him. Does that make, uh, hopefully this is inter not only entertaining, but insightful. Sure. Can I go one more story? Sure. So as, as I told you, Crystal and I decided asking is a thing that has made us successful at every level, no matter where we're up and down, up in the valley or up the hill peaking um but we wrote everything we knew about asking then we did all the study at harvard and stanford and cambridge and all of it agreed and then we said well wait a second we know all these people <clears throat> that are very successful what if we ask them we had 26 people we interviewed one is called jim stovel do you know that name no he wrote a great book i want you to read called the ultimate gift Charlie Tremendous Jones called me and said, you got to do this. I said, man, I'm selling 15 million books here. I have barely time to breathe. He said, this book will change your life. I read it. I wrote the forward. I wrote an endorsement said, this book is so good. The ultimate gift. It should be a movie. At the time, I didn't know Stovall was totally blind. You'll appreciate this. He's 19 years old. He's a superstar athlete, our Olympic champion. He wanted to be in the NFL. That's his whole goal in life. Goes, gets uh, recruited. And the doctor comes back and says, kid, I'm sorry, six months from now, you're going to be totally, permanently, forever blind. Worst day of his life. He's now sequestered in a nine by 12 room. He's got a radio, a television, and a telephone. And he's complaining. His parents say, Jimmy, 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 go down to the blind meeting. Maybe they can get you out of this. Well, it's an echo chamber of negativity. So let me do a parenthesis and say, everybody, you got to shut off the negative media today or it'll crush you. Right. This is why a second ago, Wes said, you got to be listening to positive stuff. My stuff his stuff, Zig stuff, everybody positive. You can watch my films free on YouTube, whatever, whatever gets your chain going every day. It turns on your crank and your, anyhow, he goes on, he sits next to this woman who is a court stenographer, Kathy. And he says, you know, I used to love to watch TV and somebody throw a right hook. Somebody ought to narrate that. She hits him in the ribs and says, this is a question. All of you got to ask yourself. I said, wait a second. We're somebody, why can't we do it? We're somebody, why can't we do it? And I said, an entrepreneur is somebody who fixes a problem for a profit. They created narrative TV. Make 14 million people that are blind watch narrative TV. Now, you never heard of a pride, but they make $10 a month. One of the biggest streaming services like Netflix that exists in the world, and you never heard of it. Not that that matters, but he wrote books. So we interview him for this. He is pure wisdom. Jim said, look, if I have, live 100 years, I'll thank you every day in my prayers, Mark. You're that critical to me. And I just want you to know that I now write books that I can't read. I now make movies. He made $100 million on the movie because I told him to do a movie. I now make movies that I can't see.
So blindness was his adversity, but he made it his advantage. Am I, did I tell the story clear enough so it makes sense? Yeah, it's like the old, you know, make, make your mess your message. I not heard the line, but I like it. Yeah. And everybody, you know anyone that doesn't have a mess or two? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you face, you got to be great, right? Yeah, nothing's perfect, right? I mean, you just you just end up with bigger challenges later on, but you know how to handle them because you've handled all the others. So it's just keep rolling. Yeah, that's the point. Is it when I was with W. Clement Stone, the billionaire from Chicago, he said the only thing to change when you have more money is there's more zeros and the problems are much bigger. Right. And much more costly. Yep. But theoretically, you can solve them. And the best example today of that is, I, I don't know if you like or hate as an engineer, Elon Musk, but I happen to love him. Never met him. But, uh, you know, here's a guy, who, the governor of California who's out to lunch, as far as I'm concerned, says, you cannot make your cars. So he calls up 3M and says, hey, look, you're not making enough ventilators. The president says you got to have ventilators. Give me a contract. I got steel. I got metal. I got 3D printing. I got humma, humma, humma. I'll make them. And he starts making them. But when he was making the ventilators, which he made all the ventilators for 3M, in case you didn't know, he also made cars. Made 90,000 cars and became the number one car company in America. You take adversity, turn it into advantage. And ladies and gentlemen, you got to outthink, outserve, outsource, outperform your competition because they aren't your competition. There's only one competition, yourself. You got to be your own hero. And a hero is somebody who takes a problem looks at it as an opportunity and solves it. David had five stones, only needed one to get down Goliath. Everyone's got a Goliath metaphorically in their life. Just takes one stone to knock it out. Yep. So I always tell people without Goliath, David would be an unknown shepherd boy. Yep. Didn't wouldn't have been king. Yep. Wouldn't have pulled off that cool stuff. And to get a statue in Florenza. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been awesome. I want to be respectful of your time. I'm, I'm linking here to asktheaskers.com, and I'm sure that is in the book as well, which they can get on Amazon, right? Yes, please. Get one, and I hope I meet all of you. I hope COVID gets cured. I want to go back and do seminars with lots of people, meet you all, and I want to hear your asking story or get on Ask the Askers and you know, tell us your story. And it just, we're going to go into the best times ever in America if we think we can. You can if you think you can. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, Mark Victor Hanson, all the way from Scottsdale. Thanks for coming to the show, man. It's been great. My pleasure, Wes. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Bye. You're going to love a guy as successful as him who ends the conversation with, bye. <laughs> Uh, we did, had a great time. I, um, interviewed him a couple weeks ago and I put the video right away into the, uh, 30 day sales growth group. I wanted them to see that right away. And that's a bonus of being in the group. You get access to things like this early. Um, but I hope you got a lot out of this, you know, how to shut off the negative news and information, how to program your subconscious, uh, the thought command, go deep. So many things, so many little nuggets. Um, he's got me motivated uh, reading his stuff, rereading his um, the one minute, um, uh, one minute millionaire. I mean, the guy's just a wealth of knowledge, and like I said, he's still in the game. So um, he's he's not slowing down at all. And so um, I appreciate someone like him who could just hang out and golf the rest of his life, but he's choosing to uh, invest his time, his energy, his money, his wisdom into making the world a better place. So kudos to that. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, if you need a good CRM, if you need to find the right one, let me help you. Take the free quiz, bestcrmforme.com. If you want to grow your sales, um, you can now get the entire digital uh, content of the Make Every Sale course. Um, it is available for you right now, makeeverysale.com. And it's an introductory price that is super affordable. So avail yourself of that and you will end 2020 and start 2021 on a high note. I guarantee. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.